I get my sense of spirituality through connection. And what Twitter represents is spiritual to me. Tapping into the consciousness, the larger organism, whether it be the planet, the universe, the social consciousness is what drives me. And there's a lot of power to seeing you know, how people think in ways that make us feel great and also things that are super uncomfortable because we need to be able to acknowledge them first in order to have a conversation about it. And there's no other path towards evolution and making something better unless we can talk about it. That's Jack Dorsey. And this is The Ritual Podcast. The Rich Roll Podcast. Hey, everybody. How you guys doing? What's happening? My name is Rich Roll. I'm your host. This is my podcast. And today, my guest is Jack Dorsey. Jack is the co-founder and CEO of both Twitter and Square. And somebody who I think it's fair to say, quite incontrovertibly, has become one of the most influential figures of the modern age. Somebody who has made this crazy, indelible impact on the cultural landscape by really helping shape the way that we communicate as a culture. Uh, Jack has been doing the podcast rounds lately. He's had recent appearances on a wide variety of shows, including Sam Harris, uh, two appearances on Joe Rogan, uh, Ben Greenfield the other day, and several more. Uh, And I listened to all of them. And I realized that Jack is a polarizing figure for many. Uh, But on a personal level, I have to say I found him to be quite transparent, somebody who has been open about Twitter's failures, the challenges that he and his organization have faced, continue to face, uh, as well as incredibly composed under the pressure of being held accountable for his platform's shortcomings. Uh, And my sense is that his response to many of the hard questions that are are being posed to him that have been being posed to him on all of these podcasts and interviews have left a lot of critics feeling unsatisfied. And I guess what I want to say is that if you are such a person, one of these people, then I'm not sure this podcast is going to change that view because my interest was less on retreading uh, the territory that was explored at length on Rogan, uh, nor was it an attempt to hold him to account in the way that Tim Pool did on Joe's show. Instead, or rather, my intention for this conversation was simply to better understand this human behind the curtain. In other words, what does it actually feel like to be at the helm of one of the largest and most powerful social media platforms on the planet? What does a day in the life of Jack Dorsey look like? And what daily self-care practices does he employ to mitigate the stress of his responsibilities? And just how did this young man blaze such an incredible, extraordinary entrepreneurial path? It's these kind of questions that informed how I approached this conversation. I first met Jack about two years ago, uh, and because he had tweeted out a few episodes of the podcast, I knew he was at least an occasional listener of this show. So when I found myself in San Francisco, I DM'd him to see if he wanted to meet up, and he invited me to Square, the Square headquarters. And what I discovered when I met him was a person quite different than what you might imagine. Uh, He was sitting on an open staircase by himself with a cup of tea at the far end of this giant open floor plan office space. Uh, He told me he doesn't even have a proper office. And I just found this person to be very soft-spoken, kind, curious. And I guess I realized that, that this is somebody who is an animal altogether different from the typical alpha startup CEO mold. And I liked him instantly. And although our encounter was brief, Jack left me kind of intrigued. I wanted to better understand who he is and what led him to this rarefied air and really what makes him tick. So when he began showing up on all these podcasts, I reached out to him. He invited me to his home in San Francisco. And and this is where uh, it got really interesting. Uh, Unsurprisingly, he has a beautiful home. It's very well appointed. But What was surprising was its modesty, considering his essentially unlimited resources. It's very minimal, almost Spartan. There's no entourage 
There's no private chef. He cooks his own meals. No, you know, there's no Lamborghini collection. There wasn't even an assistant there. It was just Jack, completely unpretentious, uh, barefoot, excited to show me his infrared sauna, his cold plunge, the kitchen counter where he works from his home a couple days a week. You know, all in all, a man who is very intentionally and mindfully stripped uh, excess materialism and distraction away from his life. Somebody who prioritizes solitude, contemplation, meditation. He meditates at least an hour a day uh, and a whole wide variety of self-care practices all designed to optimize uh, deep thinking uh, and equanimity, including the fact that he walks five miles to work every single day. And I guess what I'm trying to say is I found his intentionality that he brings to his life, his discipline, his curiosity, um, his presence of mind. I found it all admirable. Uh, He's a truly, truly fascinating guy living a very unusual life. So this conversation is really an exploration of that life. Uh, We do cover how Twitter was conceived, the responsibilities of logistics, the challenges involved in shaping and policing the behemoth platform that sees about 500 million tweets every day and how he envisions the evolution uh, of this platform, the impact of Twitter on culture and how he would ultimately kind of close the conversation with how he would disrupt and innovate the podcast space. And his answer is very interesting on that point. But mostly this was just my attempt to understand Jack and some of the habits, practices, And strategies that he employs, uh, including Vipassana meditation, intermittent fasting, so many more things, to navigate his most uncommon life as one of the most influential figures of our time. Final note, because it took place at Jack's home, we did not video this program. And you might hear a little crackling in the background. It's because we were sitting at the forefront, like next to his fireplace. So we had a live fire as we discussed it. It was all very nice. So this is me and Jack Dorsey. Thank you for uh, inviting me to your home. Thanks for taking time on a Saturday. Saturday afternoon, it's raining outside. We're sitting by a crackling fire. In a cloud. (laughs) We are in the cloud. I feel like I'm in Big Sur overlooking the ocean here. So if you hear waves crashing or seagulls or uh, the crackling of the fire over here, that kind of just should create a visual palette <laughs> where good. we are right now. Um, and we just did a, uh, a little meditation, five minute meditation to set the stage, which was great. I feel good, I feel good. Me too. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a natural segue into talking a little bit about um, meditation in your life. I know you've been meditating for like 20 years and um, it's something that uh, is important to you. So what does is, what is the practice look like for you? Yeah, I, I, um, I started playing with meditation about 20 years ago. It wasn't that serious. And I think the, the, the most I, you know, I, I actually practiced within that time frame was you know, probably 20, 30 minutes mm-hmm. and wasn't really aware of a lot of the theories and, um, some of the, the focus that I needed until about two years ago when I went to my first Vipassana course. I went um, uh, to this uh, little town just south of Dallas and um, did a 10-day silent meditation retreat. And it was one of the hardest, but also one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. And one of the practices of Vipassana is to do one of these retreats every year, but also to carry through with your practice, you do two hours a day, one mm-hmm. hour in the morning, uh, one hour in the evening before, before bed. And the, um, I mean, what it's, what it's done for me is, is really just a sense of clarity. Um, uh, certainly, certainly one of focus, um, certainly one of recognizing when I'm reacting to something which, uh, has this, you know, momentum of not feeling necessarily in control. Um, but, as I did it, uh, you know, at the end of last year, I just went even deeper into that clarity and was, you know, instantly reminded of the year prior. And mm-hmm. uh, you, you, I had this experience where I just felt like I was picking up where I where I left off. 
Um, and that was really powerful to me. So for me, every single day, it's a time to build self-awareness. I and mean, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. It's something I've been uh, interested in doing for some time yet. I have yet to Attend do one retreat? of the, yeah, attending one of those retreats. And, They're scary. <laughs> yeah, well, I know I've, I have plenty of friends who have done it. And from what I understand, it's, it's around the day five, day six area that you get into, you know, that make or break period where you start to freak out. Day four is really hard because you go into this mode called strong determination. Mm -hmm. And up until day four, you're basically focusing on your breath. And it's not just the concept of the breath, it's actually the physical sensation of the breath. It's the physical sensation of the breath on your upper lip and through your nostrils. And that was a huge unlock for me. But on day four, you go into Vipassana training and strong determination, which means that you are encouraged not to move at all. You, you, you know, you're sitting in a lotus or a half lotus position and you shouldn't be shifting around or moving your posture in any way whatsoever. And that becomes extremely challenging, but also um, a good reflection into what the practice actually is because you'll, at least for me, my experience was, you know, my legs were just killing me. And right. it, the, the urge to move uh, is is almost unbearable. Right. And through that, um, through observing that pain and choosing, deciding not to react to it, um, you apply that um, that concept and that methodology to everything, to emotions, to um, physical pain, to mental hardships, and uh, and being able to recognize it in that moment and train it, you know, for those next few days is a uh, is is really powerful. But day six was my worst day. Uh -huh. The morning I was a, uh, you know, I look I you you meditate with other people, but. You know, you're not allowed to talk, you're not allowed to read, to write, to do any physical exercise, to look anyone in the eye. Um, it's The conditions are such that you feel like you're on a retreat by yourself. And uh, on day six, I kind of I looked around in the hall and everyone just looked like a Buddha. They, uh -huh. <laughs> they all, they all um, looked they, like they were, they were already enlightened. And I'm like, I don't, out. I don't get this. Yeah. I, I, like, I, I, I'm not... I'm not getting it, but at the end of day six, um, you do these uh, discourses at the end where there's some insight into the theory and, and a little bit into the practice. And uh, something um, the teacher said just unlocked something for me. So the, the last meditation of the day at, at 9 p.m. Um, or at 8.30 was, um, was one of my best, and I walked out and I just felt so much peace and so much joy and I cried and then I fell asleep and I woke back up at four in the morning and was back into the pain, back into yeah. not understanding what I was doing, which again is part of the practice where you, you, you can't hang on something, you can't react overly to something that's negative and you can't react overly to something that's mm -hmm. positive either. You want to have equanimity between in, 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 in the entire spectrum. Right. And something about becoming an observer of that pain or that discomfort or that jubilation, creating some distance between yourself and that experience, I think is where the teachable moment where you can kind of mine that equanimity. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it's just 10 days of working from four in the morning until 930, mm -hmm. focused entirely on that and realizing that um, you, you won't get it right away. And mm -hmm. it's just this, the, the most important thing is, is, the, is the practice of it, not right. reaching any particular milestone or state. It's just yeah. the, that constant practice. So you stepped it up this year and you went to Myanmar yeah. to do, as opposed to Texas for another silent meditation retreat. And um, on your return from that experience, you decided to share this in a, in a threaded tweet what your experience uh, was and that, <laughs> that like became like a thing. There were a lot of people that jumped on you for not addressing the atrocities of the government when, yeah. you, you know, I, it, it was interesting cause I read it and I, I felt like you were just sharing this experience that you had. It was, it was certainly an apolitical, you know, motivation behind that. But I guess when you're Jack, you have to be much more mindful about yeah. how you choose your words and, and how you, 
decide to describe these experiences. Yeah, I um, so after my first meditation in Texas, first I I met you know this amazing teacher there, and um, is that Goenka? No, not Goenka. Goenka passed away. Yeah, I think I um, five or maybe maybe even ten years ago, and um, so he has all these assistant teachers that lead you through the the courses and. I, I met one of the assistant teachers and um, became friends with him and, you know, was talking about going, you know, doing where should I do my next meditation? And we discussed Myanmar, Burma, because that is where Goenka is from. That is where um, a lot of the practice that I was practicing has been kept in a very pure form in terms of the the writings, but also the, the physical practice. Um, and uh, after my first meditation in Texas, I had one tweet, and I just I didn't feel I was ready to to talk about it. Um, I didn't feel it was appropriate um, because I don't I didn't feel I had experienced enough to the depth that I I could communicate in a way that resonated with people. Mm-hmm. But after the se- after the second retreat in in Myanmar, I I felt um, I felt more ready. It was. Um, it was completely different. I mean, it was, I went in, um, a day before, uh, into, uh, into Myanmar. Um, I immediately went to the center and we started meditating and I, I left, uh, two days after. And I, I was there as Jack, not representing Square or Twitter. Um, I was there to focus on myself because I think one of the most important things I, I believe that I have a responsibility to both our employees and also the people that we, we serve on, on the, on the platforms is self-improvement, constant self-improvement. And I've identified this as at least this practice is something that makes me a lot stronger, a lot more resilient, uh, a lot more aware, uh, and able to, um, approach my work with a lot more clarity and, Mm -hmm. uh, and discipline. So, um, I went because of the, you know, the, the, the practices lineage within, within that, um, within that country and within that people and within the culture and wasn't really thinking enough about the surrounding circumstances of the, of the country and the people. And, you know, I, I think the, the misstep was not, um, even addressing that, focusing entirely on meditation. That was my intent, which, which was to focus this entirely on my, my experience. Mm-hmm. And if it resonates with people, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it did resonate with folks, but there was, there was an ask to uh, just be more aware of the surroundings, shine more light on that. And, and I, I get all that. The, the benefit is I did have a lot of um, um, social groups reach out to me immediately after um, and folks come to me to uh, at least converse about, you know, what is happening and what has changed. Mm-hmm. And um, there are multiple um, atrocities within the country, not not just the one that um, tend to be focused on. The Rohingya. Um, yeah. So um, I, I've learned since you know a bunch of the dynamics and and uh, and you know some of the ways I I might be able to help, but um, I'm still I'm still in a I'm still in a learning phase where you know just where where can I actually apply myself and 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 help and and, and drive more of the conversation within the within the country. Mm-hmm. So. It touched me, um, and uh, it, it, it's something that I will, uh, will definitely be top of mind for for quite some time. But I, I think it was, <laughs> yeah. but it was important for Learn next time. Yeah, but it was important for me to also see that in person and experience it in person rather than read it mm-hmm. through text or read it through um, the uh, the major media channels mm-hmm. um, and, and see the people. And one of the biggest surprises I had was every single monk I. Saw every every nun I ran into had a had a cell phone, and um, Facebook is the internet. It's similar to you know when back in the day when AOL was the internet for many people. It wasn't about a web browser. It was you know the way in was was AOL and and Facebook was that for 
for nearly everyone in the in the country. You didn't you don't see URLs, you don't see website mm-hmm. addresses, you see um, Facebook pages, and uh, it, it's just so dominant. And I I didn't have that understanding, and I don't think I would have the depth of understanding unless I actually went there and experienced it myself. And what do you extract from that? The fact that you know Facebook is the internet there, like what you know, what does that bode for the future? What does that mean? Having um, having grown up with the internet in St. Louis, Missouri, I was a hacker early on in, in my life. You know, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and St. Louis had this thriving hacker community, and it was a uh, you know, it, it had a lot of the punk ethos. Uh-huh. Uh, it, it had a lot of the techno ethos. Later, it had a bunch of the hip hop ethos in terms of just questioning everything, um, working in public, sharing everything, sharing all the mistakes, not being centralized at all. Um, I think uh, there's elements that are that are certainly uh, dangerous to that. Uh, I I'm definitely um, skeptical of centralized organizations, even my own, even Twitter and Square. You know, I, I think the the internet more than anything else has allowed us to remove so many barriers and boundaries that can tend to be artificial. Um, and, uh, and, and this promise of at least providing the framework and the infrastructure towards a understanding of a of one humanity, like we we have the technology to do this, and it started in 1979. And the ideals just get stronger and stronger and stronger. So, um, starting with a more decentralized medium, and and you know the uh, a recent flow towards more centralization, uh, such as Google and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Square. Um, is something I'm very, very cognizant of, and also, uh, I, I, I don't discount the the power and and also the skepticism and lack of trust that people have in organizations like ours. So I I think on the positive, it does breed a healthy skepticism and distrust, which I think is useful to push companies like ours to be a lot more open and push towards more towards more internet ideals. Um, but there's certainly a hard road to get there. But I, I, I would want to see a place like Myanmar um, to have more entry points than than just Facebook, obviously. Right. But at the same time, they've gotten a lot of people on who were not on before and and on the network. And um, I, I think we have to weigh the trade offs of you know the. Um, Getting people on ramp into this global network, uh, and and the the custodian that does it, and then hopefully hold organizations like my own uh, to account in terms of making sure that they see all the pathways in and out, and uh, and have optionality. Right. I feel like this, um, you know, desire to hold yourself and and your companies to to account for this is sort of part and parcel of this, you know, for lack of a better phrase, like podcast tour that you've been on lately, uh, you know, out of the blue, all of a sudden, uh, you've made yourself available to talk to all manner of people. You've been on tons of shows. Um, not and, enough. Not, <laughs> not, I don't know, a lot. I mean, you did one yesterday, like a crypto one yesterday I saw. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, you've done Sam Harris, Joe Rogan. I think you're going back to talk to Joe. You did uh, Bill yeah. Simmons. Um, Clearly, there's a conscious decision here to to step out and share your perspective in a transparent way. And my sense of this is that you've done that with a large degree of equanimity. I think the equanimity was seen in that exchange with Kara Swisher, where you did that experiment and conversation by doing it on Twitter. Um, you maintained your cool under fire. Like I, 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 in that, I saw meditation coming oh, to the you. front in the way that you managed all of that. But just the fact that you're making yourself available for these conversations, I, I find interesting. And so I think the first, I have two questions on that. The first is, um, you know, what is, you know, what was behind this decision to do this and, and, and you know, right now? Yeah, I, I mean, I have a f- I've had a few goals with this. One, um, 
I'm a student of conversation and Twitter's purpose in the world is to serve the public conversation. And in the same light, I am aware that I'm absolutely terrible at, at it. And I am uh, Why afraid do you say of it. That? Why do you say that? Well, I, you know, I was, um, when I was a kid, I had a speech impediment mm-hmm. and it, I, I went through a lot of speech therapy. I, I couldn't pronounce most words. Um, I just it sound like gibberish was coming out of my mouth and to some people that still may be the case, but um, I, I really pulled back uh, because of that, uh, that awareness that I was dysfunctional in some way in, in communicating with people. And I, I became extremely shy. I've always been an introvert, meaning that I get most of my energy from solitude versus extroverts getting a lot of their energy from being around people. So mm-hmm. I, I, I'm naturally at that um, predisposition towards being more quiet and being uh, more in solitude, but that really pushed me into a very, very shy place where uh, you know even conversations with my parents or brothers um, were were somewhat limited. And eventually, I realized it in fifth or sixth grade, and I just said like I I can't function like this. And I joined the speech club, and I joined the debate club, and I did the things that just freaked freaked me out, but that still that still lingers you know i i I still am hyper aware of how i'm talking and um you know just a little bit of uh uncomfort in my own skin and conversation but i wanna i think i think my the characteristics that have made me realize some of the milestones i want hit in my life and some of the excess success i've realized is that I will put myself in very uncomfortable situations. I will be patient with myself and I will learn super fast. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I felt, number one, that um, podcasting was a great way to do that. It's something I'm a huge consumer of. Uh, I, you know, my, my walks in the morning, it's what I listen to. It's, it's what I take the most joy in in, in the morning. And uh, I, I just get so much so much out of them that I, I also um, wanted to understand the format much more directly. And then, second, um, we we don't talk enough out in the open uh, about what we're seeing, how we're thinking, why, um, and we do that in you know articles and and the traditional press, but. There's something about podcasting to me that just allows much, much more nuance and just some time to breathe. And uh, yeah. and the, I think that the thing I enjoy well certainly in- compared to Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We'll we'll talk about. I that mean, too. the irony that that <laughs> that you're gun shy about conversation uh, when you know facilitating conversation is the core you know uh, foundational goal of Twitter itself. I yeah I don't know if it's the gun shy that I feel I just I, I know that um, I know I want to master it and I, I want to I want to get really great at it and I know I have a long way to go not not just in conversations like this but also personally mm-hmm. as well and if I could study one thing that also serves uh, my company given our 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 role then amazing yeah. um, so I you know I I, I think um, the, the thing I love most about podcast going back to my introvertness is conversations like this where you you can actually hear the silence between thoughts and like just the the amount Mm -hmm. of time that people take to to think and um there's just so much fidelity within that silence that i i find intriguing and interesting and there's just a rhythm that i'm trying to understand and and uh and a master as well so so that's a big part of it A, a lot of it this year has has you know honestly been you know, somewhat reactive people. We've, we've, we don't have a strategist in terms of like who we've been talking to, who I've been talking to. Um, a lot of folks have been asking me for quite some time and I, I pushed it off and just been kind of going down the queue. And, um, yeah. and, uh, and I'm also, you know, happy to meet uh, a bunch of the folks that I, I listen to, uh, all the time. Like I'm, I'm going to be going on, uh, Ben Greenfield's, mm-hmm. uh, pretty soon and, 
I, I, I listen to every single one of his podcasts and, and I think I, I learn so much from him and, uh, I, uh, so I'm excited personally just to, just to get into it with him. I have no idea what we'll talk about because he is so health, health focused and <laughs> it's going to be, so, I would uh, imagine be really <laughs> granular on like your day, you know, daily yeah. practices. Yeah. Which yeah. I'm also excited to talk about because I, I, I don't, I don't get to talk about that a lot with the exception of my friends and some of my coworkers who, who just think I'm the weirdest person in the world. Well, we're going to get into it a little bit, probably not <laughs> to the extent that Ben will. Um, but I think that, that, you know, your observations are correct. I mean, in many ways, I see podcasts as an antidote to what ails Twitter because it provides that space for nuance. And I think anybody is hard pressed to walk away from a conscientious, mature, mindful, long form podcast um, between two people, uh, even if you completely disagree with that person's worldview, it's almost like uh, because we're empathetic creatures, we're able to see the shared humanity. And, and I think that's something that, that, that Twitter just isn't built for yeah. you know, well, in well, many ways. I wanna, you know, I want us to figure this out because I, I, th- I don't think it's just voice or video that creates empathy. I, 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 text certainly can create the same. I, I think we have not um, unlocked that from an experience standpoint, from mm-hmm. a pacing standpoint. I, I think we've provided exactly the wrong incentives on the, on the service. And what I mean by that is when you open up the app, what are we inherently telling you to do implicitly? Um, you know, what, what are you, what are we guiding you through the arrangement of the buttons through the numbers and the metrics that we provide, um, we're, we're, we're giving people guidelines in terms of what they should optimize for. And I think right now they're completely wrong. Like, you know, we, we made a decision quite some time ago to make the size of your, your, your follower count bold and big on your profile page. And we have this like button, uh, we have a retweet, uh, we haven't really, opined on the ordering of those of those actions and, mm-hmm. and what what that means so when we when we built this you know we we discovered these features and these gaps and then we put them on the interface and i don't think we gave it enough consideration because we didn't have we didn't have this focus on this on this purpose of conversation there was some of it was reactive to our peers some of it was looking at good ideas over there and and putting it in, in our service, but we're, we're taking time now to step back and say like, how do we truly serve a public conversation? Not just people posting, not people posting quick takes or hot takes or outrage, but like, how do we, how do we incentivize more contribution that is healthy to the network? And, mm-hmm. and, and this is a concept that we're really spending a lot of time thinking about is this concept of conversational health and what that means. And um, it, it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm fascinated for my own personal health and why I get into all the practices like meditation that I do is because I, I feel that there is something to being able to understand when a conversation is healthy or not. And I know it because like we've all had, we've all had conversations that feel toxic and you just want to walk away from it. And we've had conversations that feel really empowering and inspiring and you, you, you wish they lasted for hours and hours and hours. And, um, if, if we can, if we can feel that, I, I feel we can also quantify it enough that we can understand at scale what these things look like and, and what, um, what actions have the greatest potential to create more of them. And so right now we're just, you know, we're in this phase where we're trying to understand what it means to measure whether an online digital conversation is healthy or not. And so what are the technological parameters by which you would adjudicate the health of a conversation? We're, um, we, we started with, um, probably the best way to, um, articulate this is, is, is the body metaphor. And, you know, we, we have all these indicators of health on our body. Um, one is, you know, just the flushness of your face. The other is uh, your body temperature. Um, And, 
you have this internal body temperature should be a, should be 98.6 Fahrenheit. And if it's above that or below that, it indicates that something is out of balance. It doesn't say what, but it indicates that probably something is in, out, of, out of imbalance. Mm-hmm. And we built this tool called a thermometer to measure that indicator. And then based on that reading, uh, we can start diagnosing solutions. And, you know, I, I could read that your, your temperature is really high and I can give you a glass of water, hot water with lemon in it, and say, based on all of our experience, on all of our research, if you drink this, there's a higher probability that it will bring your system back into balance, at least this particular indicate, indicator, faster than this red wine that I'm about to hand you. And then you have a choice. Do I, do I take this or this red wine, which based on all of our evidence, all of our research, all of our experiences, creates a probability that probably extends the amount of time that your system is in balance. So you can, you can push that to the digital, and then it's, you know, it, it's what are the indicators of, of, of conversational health. So we have four stakeholder indicators um, that we've shared with the world that we're, we're working to understand how to measure right now, like we're working to build the thermometers for these indicators. Number one is shared attention. How much of the conversation is attentive to the same things versus on disparate things. Number two is shared reality. Are we, is this, you know, is this conversation sharing the same facts or are they different facts? Like a, a, an example as a way of judging how siloed a certain conversation ex- is. Exactly. Like, so it's not to find truth. It's not to find what is factual or what is not factual, but just like what facts are people using and what percentage of the conversation is using this fact basis versus another one. So a, a recent example is, you know, the round earth versus the flat earth right. um, conversation. So 99.999% of this conversation is using a fact that the earth is round, whereas whereas a small percentage is using a, uh, a fact that the world is flat. So um, healthier conversation will be sharing more facts. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's number two. Number th- three is receptivity. So how receptive are the participants to engaging in a civil way in debate and dialogue? And finally is variety of perspective. Is it a high variety of perspective or is it a filter bubble or echo chamber? And these four, ideally, as they go higher, conversation is very healthy. So you want you know, presence and attention. You want to sh- be sharing the same facts to have a debate around them. You want both to be receptive. You want um, a variety of uh, opinion and perspective um, so that we can build off each other and, and, and so that we can iterate. Um, but we also realize that if you do something to increase one, it might have a negative impact on another. So, you know, you might increase variety of perspective by bringing more perspectives into the conversation. And by doing so, you might decrease shared reality or you might decrease shared attention. So just like the temperature of your body, there are other indicators of health that have some sort of connection. And while your your body temperature might go into balance, other indicators like the flush under your skin might get aggravated more. So then how do you take that information that you aggregate and build tools that facilitate conversation to move in that direction? I mean, that's, that's the, you know, the hard part. Yeah. So, so, um, so an example um, is, you know, one, we need to identify if these are the right indicators. We do so by actually building the measurement tools uh, to get a somewhat of a baseline measurement. And we're not doing this alone. We're doing it with external parties as well. Researchers, uh, MIT, Cortical Labs um, defined the first four indicators. And they're actually doing it not just for Twitter, but for talk radio, mm-hmm. podcasting as well, um, uh, to, to measure that, the, the percentage of conversations there. And as we build an understanding baseline of the, of the measurement, then we can start deploying solutions and we can watch how it deviates from the baseline. So an example of a solution might be, we have all these people sharing links, sharing articles. And I might share an article 
um, from Fox News or New York Times. And um, I might share that article and have my own um, kind of view on this, like saying a tweet of, this article is spot on or this is completely off the mark and this is all the reasons why. One of the things we experimented with is when we see those articles shared um, to sh uh, bring up other tweets that might have different perspectives mm -hmm. as indicated by the text that they're sharing on top of the URL. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, you, you, might, uh, you might then see for the same article, for the same link, two different perspectives on it. And there's some research to indicate that that emboldens people into their views. There's other research to indicate that that at least gets people thinking about what their viewpoint means and, and how that evolves. So that, that's just one experiment. And then we, we can run that and then we can look at how it affects some of those metrics at scale. We're, we're super early on in this. Another one mm -hmm. um, is uh, the Brexit conversation. You know, the only tool right. that, and this kind of gets to the core fundamentals of the service, we only give you the ability to follow an account. So if you were a vote lever, you're probably following folks like uh, Boris and, and Nigel and, and related accounts. Very, very few people, and they're mainly journalists, follow accounts that have a completely different perspective than themselves. Um, very few people watch CNN and then immediately flip to Fox News mm -hmm. um, just to get the other other theater and, and the other movie that's that's playing on this on, on the on the same reality so um, if you follow only those people you're probably only getting reasons to leave but if you were to do a little bit more work and you saw the vote leave hashtag vote leave trending and you tap into that you'll see 99% of the conversation reasons to leave, but you might see 1% of reasons to stay. And in that, case, in that case, at least there is some potential to see a different perspective and see diversity of opinion. But we make that so hard for people. You can't follow a hashtag today. You can't even get into that conversation where there is even an element of variety of perspective. So those are the things we're looking at. If we allow someone to follow a hashtag or follow a topic, does that increase variety of perspective? Does it increase shared reality? Does it um, increase shared attention or does it diminish those things? Yeah, it's that extra step that you have to do right now. I mean, if you go to what's trending and you click on a hashtag, you're gonna see, in general, my experience is you'll see a smattering of different perspectives on that issue. But if you could follow an issue with an at, like at you know, issue X, yeah and then your feed would be propagated with different perspectives on that issue, it would break the chains of the silo effect that's creating so much toxicity. But I think it also, um, it, uh, it means that you have an optimistic perspective on the malleability <laughs> of, a human, of, of a human psychology. Right. Oh yeah, I mean, I because people are bringing in a lifetime of experience that has formed a certain perspective, and just because you're going to pepper that feed with a, a smattering of different views doesn't mean that it's going to change that person's worldview. Totally, and maybe I, it shouldn't. I don't know, and I don't know if that's your responsibility, but certainly there is a you know a level of toxicity right now on on your platform that I know you're endeavoring to address, but these are very difficult problems to overcome. Yeah, and I, I, I don't think it's our responsibility to change their view. I do think it's our responsibility to set up the circumstances where if they choose to look outside their own view or to add to their view or, or challenge their own view that it's easy to do so. Right mm -hmm. now it's extremely difficult. And, right. and, and, and we, we saw this in 2016, 2015, leading up to the election, um, this, uh, you know, this uh, MIT Cortico Lab um, put out a um, put out a uh, infographic that showed you know a number of the journalists on the left quote unquote left end of the spectrum were not following folks on the right, whereas folks on the right were following folks on the left, mm -hmm. and you see these huge siloed concentrations of people on the left who are, are just feeding themselves with stories uh, around what's going to happen. Whereas folks on the right end of the spectrum were, were seeing everything. 
And these are just journalists. These are journalists. Right, and journalists, journalists by and large are gonna be people that are, are, are more likely to follow a difference of opinion. Typically, but in leading up to the US mm-hmm. election, uh, according to the graph, they were not. Right. Uh, they were certainly not enough. Um, and I mean, to, to me, the most dangerous thing about what we've done as a service is to incentivize more of these echo chambers and filter bubbles mm-hmm. and not give people tools to at least change the probability that they would see more. Right. Um, and, uh, and that I think, you know, can embolden a lot more toxicity, can embolden a lot more of the bad faith actors who intend to disrupt, which we, we saw um, certainly leading up, um, but, but you know, Twitter will be 13 years old in March, and we've we've probably seen this throughout our lifetime. Um, and a lot of it has to do with you know we've we made a system that people have figured out how to how to game, yeah. and uh, and we we haven't had enough punitive actions, <coughs> with the exception of uh, this very binary decision of leave up or take down. And and that that very binary action is just not enough. It's not nuanced enough, especially if you take a broader view on humanity and you believe in the concepts of rehabilitation or redemption, um, or you know at least showing people, you know the a path towards health and greater participation in, in the in the same sense of like giving people the choice of drinking the water or the wine right. when they're sick. We, we don't do that. We, um, you know, we have this very, very blunt tool of, uh, of uh, leave up or, or remove. Mm-hmm. At the same time, the acceleration with which, you know, sophisticated, well-financed uh, entities are weaponizing the platform is only going to increase. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think there's an analogy to doping in sports in the sense that, you know, the doping, um, the sophistication of the doping is always a step or two ahead of the policing body's ability to detect, right? So the entity is always playing catch up to what's ahead. And it seems like that's a similar game that's afoot here. Totally, in, in, in the technology world, the, the metaphor would be security. So, right. you know, um, I forget the exact quote, but Edgar Allan Poe brought this up quite some time ago, um, where you know he he believed he was able to build a um, cryptographic puzzle that no one could crack, and quickly learned that anything that one person can design, another person can break down. Right. And security, probably at a surface level is considered to, you know, your, your goal might be one of perfection, a, 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 pure, a purely um, perfect system that no one can break into. But the, the reality of it is the mindset should be one of constant observation, learning, and improving. You, you want to t- stay 10 steps ahead of your, of your attackers. And the way you do so is by really looking at patterns of how they are testing the system and attacking the system. And when you find them, iterate a few steps ahead and then share all your findings so the whole community can get much better. And you, you just take out that, that one potential, potential vector. So, so on that rubric, how would you grade Twitter's performance on that? Um, very, pu- very poor. Um, because I think for the majority of our lifetime, you know, we were fairly mechanical in our approach to technology. We were not utilizing um, machine learning and deep learning to lift some of the burden, certainly from our own folks who have to enforce all of our rules, but also lifting the burden from the victims. Like our, our system right now is just not fair. You know, our our, our system works entirely on if I'm a victim of abuse, I report that someone just harassed me or dox me or whatnot. And then right. we it's, it's send that. It's entirely dependent upon reporting. Yeah, we- It's we, not scalable. It's impossible to monitor that. Not scalable, but ultimately not fair. Why uh-huh. should the victim have that burden? And um, so we, we weren't able to even consider removing that because we just weren't as sophisticated with 
machine learning and deep learning as we are now. So now our number one goal along this health vector is proactive um, monitoring of our system so that we can catch some of these things before someone even has to report it. And there's a variety of tools that we can use to enforce, whether it be um, uh, asking people to remove tweets, um, temporary suspensions, all the way to the uh, to to the worst option, which is you know a, a permanent suspension. Which mm-hmm. ultimately, you know, over time, we we shouldn't feel great about. Like we we weren't able to rehabilitate. We weren't able to incentivize and show people why healthy approaches and behaviors and um, participation would increase their reach or increase the value they got out of the service. So, so that ultimately is where we want to get to. But um, we're um, right now we're, we're focused on number one, like how do we, this is another thing I don't think our industry does enough of is we haven't really admitted the connection between the digital world and the physical world. And um, there's a lot that happens on Twitter that I, I think we could scope entirely to online and we'd miss everything else that's happening offline or what it, those offline ramifications. So Meaning things like doxing or where doxing, phys- physical so, harm really becomes a yeah. palpable reality. So the, so the number one thing we want to protect now is someone's physical safety. So it, it, it sounds a little bit odd for a, a, a predominantly digital company to say that we should be focused on protecting physical safety, but it has real manifestations. Someone doxing, uh, which is sharing private information about someone's physical location or phone number or email address puts a person in, you know, a, 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 some physical jeopardy, sa- safety jeopardy, and at least raises a potential. So could we, um, can, can we recognize when those, when those occurrences happen in real time and, and prevent it? And um, if we can do that, and that's a tightly scoped, problem, then we can extend it to more and more of the cases that we see every single day, especially what women on our platform experience on a daily basis. And um, so we, we, we want to get to a, something that is really measurable, that has impact on you know someone's real world physical life, and then tie it back to what we're doing online. And I, I just think as an industry, we need to focus more on that connection between the physical mm-hmm. and the and the online. And um, and 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 show the show the progress. We you know we we talk a lot about this, but we 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 really have to show it. So now that we have a lot more sophistication around machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, we can automate a lot more of this. But a, a big part of us progressing in the right way is scoping it so that we can really make the problem very very small. Get some sort of success or at least a path towards success there and then and then broaden it out. Right. So you've been going on all these podcasts and talking to a lot of people about these problems and 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 how you're attempting to you know wrap your brain trust around how to solve them and the early stages of of actually solving them. Um, do you think that like like what's your sense of of how this campaign is going? Like is this working? <laughs> I <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know that it is. And here, let me just say this, and then I'll let you talk. I have this sense that you're in an impossible situation because you're coming on board, you're coming online, and you're talking about these things. Um, and I feel like you're being very transparent and very earnest about it, and very thoughtful. Uh, but you're not giving people the answers that they like. The answers are just not inherently satisfying. Right or or the timeline is off or something, and so people are left feeling like they're not getting a direct response. Like you, you've been accused of being evasive. I don't think you're being evasive, but perhaps uh, people are just wanting to see the results more quickly. Like, how are you thinking about this, or what's your sense? Well, how this is going. <clears throat> First and foremost, we have to realize that we have to we have to show, not tell. And my goal here is not to um, 
my goal here is not to, first of all, I don't consider this a campaign. Uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's important okay. that we have these Fair conversations enough. in public and that we, we show our, our thinking and we, I, I, want to, I want to bring up ideas in public that people can push against. And I want to hear the feedback and I want to, I want to get the reaction because it'll make our answers much better. And while people might not be satisfied with the level that they're currently at in terms of abstraction, we have to start there to get to something tangible mm -hmm. and real. And I, I think a lot of people fairly come at this as specifically, why haven't you banned this one person or mm -hmm. why haven't you taken action on, on these particular things? And it's, the answer is it. It's not one case. These these are extremely extremely challenging, and and a lot of it has to do with the context of the conversation. Just as an example, there are particular racial slurs that are used uh, in a way that um, are harassing of of folks um, and uh, meant to silence a voice or to get a voice off the platform. And uh, in other communities and contexts, they're perfectly okay. Um, an example of this is, you know, we have, um, we have a bunch of uh, gamers on, on Twitter. And every day we have an exchange between two people saying, hey, Rich, you know, I'm, I'm gonna kill you tonight. Mm -hmm. And in one context, that's a violent threat. And that is something that we would act on. In another context, it's a game. And what that person meant was that I'm going to kill you in this game tonight. So those are the sorts of nuances that we have to pay attention to in the context. We have to, we have to actually look at the context of the relationship between the two people and how they're engaging. So in the old days, we were fairly mechanical in that we looked at the specific words and content being used uh -huh. Now we have to shift to look at the network. We have to look at the actions on the network, at the behavior on the network. You have to contextualize it against the history of past behavior. Exactly, right. and, and we have a, a number of other occurrences where we get accused of um, taking content down or permanently suspending someone because of something that they said, which seems completely innocuous. But what was happening in the background was they had 17 accounts that they had control of that were all in unison in a coordinated fashion attacking one particular account with mm -hmm. the intent to silence um, or trigger this person or they uh, we ban them in the past for a particular activity and then they are trying to evade our brand ban which is against our terms of service so there's a lot on the surface but there's even more underneath um, that has to do with behavior conduct and activity that is against our terms of service that we take action on and where we have failed <clears throat> people is explaining the reasons why we take action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's as if it takes place in a, in a black box. Yeah, and without... in some cases that's because there, there might be private information um, mm -hmm. that even um, either a, a, a victim or a, 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 a bad faith actor uh, might compromise them in some way. And in, in some cases it might be an active investigation. So. There's even nuance in how transparent we can be around the actions that we take on the platform. So, but then the reaction to to the consumer is that it looks haphazard and, and yeah, it looks so random. It, it looks random and right. And 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 what the attention is all on these specific case studies, like whether it's Alex Jones or Jake Wall or you know these specific individuals that get a lot of press and attention for their you know behavior on your platform. Um, I'm I'm curious as to like how under what circumstances does one of these case studies like rise to your attention as somebody who's running two different companies and has a tremendous amount of responsibility for you know keeping both of these sh you know ships Square and Twitter running in a certain direction uh, you know I can't imagine that you can roll up your sleeves and get too involved in specific scenarios but I would imagine from time to time, it, it does require your, your attention and your discretion as to what to do. Yeah, so <clears throat> to, to start with the principles of my approach and how I think about this, number one is I wanna build a service and a company that outlives me. 
that doesn't require me being there, does, that doesn't require my attention. So by definition, that means that we distribute nearly all of our decision making. And to me, you know, one of the things that I look for is like, if, if I have to make a decision, I see it as an organizational failure. You know, it, it's, it's something that for whatever reason, and it's likely my fault, you know, I, I haven't set up the right organizational structure. I don't have a team dynamic that can work through debate or um, disagreement. I, um, I haven't presented or we haven't presented the problem with the right context mm-hmm. or maybe we're going after the wrong problem. So it's all my fault ultimately. But if, if I have to make a decision, I, I think there is something wrong with the organization and, and uh, it's not, that's what I need to fix. It's not making the decision, it's fixing exactly that. So my role then, and my second principle is, I need to ask questions in terms of how we're making this, this, these decisions and why we're making these decisions and raise the bar through my questions. Right. Raise the bar in terms of how we're thinking about our customers, the people that we serve, um, the secular trends that are happening, whether they be societal or cultural or um, legal or technological. Um, and then do we, do we have a broader context that is cohesive across the company and also our, our peer set? So um, in cases like um, Alex Jones or um, Jacob recently, I was notified that we're taking action. Uh, it wasn't brought to me with a question of like, should we do this or not? Uh-huh. Um, I was notified that we're taking action. And um, oftentimes I ask, well, w- why did we take this action? What evidence do we have to take the action? Or in the reverse, I see, I see something that's on the platform that looks like we should have taken action, but we didn't. And I send that to the team and say, what's going on here? And again, this points to our failure in terms of the dependency on reporting in that, you know, we only see what's reported. So sometimes I see it and I ask the question and that kind of serves as a report. But there is no case at my tenure as CEO that I've made a decision on one of these cases or reversed a decision by the team. Um, I have asked a lot of probing questions. Um, in some cases, those questions lead to uh, lead to really looking at our process. If it does, uh, I make damn sure that we admit when we make a mistake and what we've learned from it within the the bounds of what we can share, obviously, usually around privacy Uh or, or, or legal standards. So, um, that I think that I believe is my role. And, and again, it's all against this principle of like, if I'm not here, if I die tomorrow, the company needs to be able to continue. And we have to build this into a framework, not into people. We have to think about systems, not in these single points of failure in, in humans. And, we, you know, we 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 just have a lot of work to do that and building into the algorithms and the machines. And even when we do that, even when we move more towards a world where algorithms are doing more of our work, there's some significant issues. One, our algorithms right now can't explain why they make the decisions they make. Uh-huh. Uh, they don't. That's that's highly problematic. Extremely scary, especially <laughs> yeah. you know you're you're wearing an aura ring. I'm wearing an I aura know. ring. You know, people wear. Apple watches and the Apple watch every now and then will tell you when to stand. You know, if, if we don't, if we start offloading more and more of our decisions to these devices and we don't yeah. understand why they're making the decisions they're informing us to take. And they can't tell you why. And they can't tell you why, then it's really, really dangerous. So we need to invest in explainability. This is a field of research in AI that mm-hmm. um, is quite fascinating. We need to invest in uh, removing bias from machine learning models and um, and artificial intelligence, which which we are doing, but these are these are very very early things. But even you know even as we move more of these um, uh, enforcement actions and policies uh, to to algorithms, people need to be able to see why the actions taken are are taken, and if they can't see it, they won't trust it. So we, you know, we have a few operating principles as a company. One, we believe, you know, our purpose is to serve the public conversation. 
our desire is to promote health in that public conversation. Two, we want to earn trust and earning trust comes through a variety of, of methods, transparency, reliability, consistency, so that we don't appear random, um, deliberateness. When you read our rules, you understand them and you can see why we acted in the particular way we acted based on the rules or why our algorithms mm -hmm. uh, did, did the very same thing. So, you know, we're, we're just putting these principles in place. We're just building these models. We're investing in research areas like explainability and, and, uh, and, and bias in ML. But, you know, it, 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 it is going to take some time and that's not satisfying. And I, I think people get frustrated because we talk about it, but I, I want to talk about it. I want to share some of these ideas. I want to share where we are in the journey. I want right. to, I want to show the map and like where we've come from and, where we're trying to get to and in pointing where we're trying to get to open a dialogue so that people can really push back on us and, um, and say, you're, you're going in the wrong direction and here's why. And you should consider this other, this other path. Uh, that's the power of our service. You, you can see how people are thinking, uh, about any topic under the sun and you, you get the sense of global consciousness immediately. So we also have to take advantage of that as well. Yeah. I appreciate the transparency and I, and I think the openness and the willingness to entertain um, pushback speaks to your punk rock roots a little bit. <laughs> uh, I feel like from a, a, a PR publicity strategy, um, it might've behooved you to, to be like introducing a new feature to Twitter to address these things. And then sort of said, here's, here's the first of many things to come, but we're introducing this new thing. And this is because of this. And it would have given you a little bit of, uh, of insulation, I think, against yeah. the people that feel like you're, you're, you know, there, that there's a lot of talk. But um, the the challenge with that, I I agree with you. I mean, I, I, that would feel good. But the challenge with that is like there's there's not going to be any one feature that like makes um, one significant debt. This right. is going to be a constant iteration. Unless you finally allowed people to edit their tweets. <laughs> We're that not might, gonna get into all of that. That might help like, some <laughs> things. That might help some things. Yeah. But it's um if if we if we put too much uh weight on any one particular feature, I think it's doomed to fail. Like mm -hmm. a lot of this work has to do with constantly iterating our models, mm -hmm. you know, learning in real time at scale, observing. Just this model of observing, learning, and improving is mm -hmm. something we want to move. Our, our issues in the past is we've just moved too slowly on that on that mindset. Whereas we, on that model, we were able to much, much faster because we've improved dramatically our infrastructure. We've got a lot more sophisticated about how to apply technology in the right way. But I, I definitely hear I definitely hear the call, and there are certain features like like edit or you know putting all the conversations of the service or giving people more control. Um, over who can reply or how they mm -hmm. moderate comments within the replies. Mute, mute, yeah, mute, mute replies mute, or mute. I think or is just a, turn off any reaction to yeah. a tweet, like yeah, in the yeah. way that you can turn comments off on YouTube. And we're experimenting with all those, but all of them have another side, right? You know that you know. Recently, we we tweeted about we are experimenting with people um, enabling, giving, having more control over, um, the replies. So one of the things we're, we're testing is, um, like if you have a tweet and, um, some jerk replies to you, um, giving you the ability to hide it, mm -hmm. um, and not delete it, but hide it, which kind of moves it over to another, um, call it tab that, allows outside observers who are not, you know, you or that replier to actually see that you moderated that reply. Um, but for your own conversation, you can be the host of that conversation. You can, you can edit it, you can curate it a, a bit more. You can't delete the tweet from the platform, but you, you can push it to the side and which forces people to, to do some work, but also ha gives them some visibility into what you moderate. And the reason why this is important is because a lot of um, what's been great about Twitter have been activists and, and whistleblowers and journalists who, you know, a powerful figure might tweet something and then you see an immediate reaction in terms of, well, actually that's just not true. That's not factual. Like, you know, I, I'm sure you probably 
at least seen or heard about everything that was going on in the in the fire festival mm-hmm. and one of the things that you see within the documentaries is the activity by the social media managers to delete rapidly right. all the comments that call it out as a fraud and if we just allowed pure deletion of tweets because you as a person didn't like them then we you miss that huge opportunity to um to call out and to and to speak truth to to power in a way so and we if, need to go- do these if your goal is to overcome tribalism and the siloing of, of information that, that contravenes that. It's important. Goal. So there's a feature like that that is big and will have impact on someone's individual experience, mm-hmm. but it comes at cost. And we need to mitigate the cost um, that, it, it, uh, that it brings with it. In, in this case, you know, diminishing um, the potential for echo chambers, diminishing um, people to to share different facts and, um, or, uh, you know, speaking truth to power. There's a certain inevitability to Twitter. I think you've even tweeted, like if, if, if Twitter wasn't invented, then, you know, Twitter would have been invented, right? Like yeah. that, that, that we're of the moment where something like this would have come along had it not been for you and Biz and Ev. Um, but I'm interested in, in like what the internal experience has been for you, because I look at you, I look at Biz, I don't know Ev, but between you and Biz, like you guys are, I mean, Biz was designing book covers, like you were, you know, into fashion design and I was all over the botanical place. illustration <laughs> and punk rock. And I mean, like two really inherently creative people. I mean, you're not graduates of Harvard Business School. Um, not graduates at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Like that it's, it's so improbable and in certain respects, beautiful that this creation came out of came out of this you know special group of people um, who, at the time, intended it to be a, a a means for for people to to connect, right? To just share information about their lives. And Twitter has since become something else entirely. In certain respects, I mean, it still retains that aspect of it, but you could have never predicted what it has matured into. And I'm interested in how that feels, like to be sitting, you know, right in the middle of all of this, having to make these kinds of decisions that we're discussing today and and, and try to navigate this, you know, behemoth in the right direction. Um, like, what is that like? I mean, it, one, it, it it feels amazing. I mean, I, I, I think um, my my co-founder Ev said it said it perfectly recently. You know, he said, you know, we we often have to, we often talk about everything that could have gone wrong with Twitter um, to not enable it to continue to thrive and to be useful to people, but just have to pay attention to how much had to go exactly right for this to happen. And uh-huh. you know, we're all. Um, we're all pretty quirky uh, and uh, and 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 fairly weird, and you know, I, I think the the best aspect of Twitter is that it's it's a little bit it's a little bit weird. Mm-hmm. It's it's a weird little thing, and you know, we we built this because we wanted to use it, and and it, that was the intention. We we wanted to use this technology in this way, and and it was just you know, I I wanted to be able to go off anywhere and. And share what I was seeing, share what was happening, and I wanted to be able to follow Biz and see what he was thinking and see what was happening. And then, I think the most beautiful thing about Twitter is that people showed us what they wanted it to be. And um, you know, I, I think being able to be observant enough to really listen to what something wants to be, to me, is true creativity. And I, you know, we, we had this amazing fortune in that we were able to build something that felt very foundational, but was ultimately a, um, a discovery. I mean, we, we discovered something essential, something very, very low level. Mm -hmm. And because it was so low level, because it was so essential, because it was so, you know, this core foundational layer uh, people built social norms on top of it. And the first such norm was 
using the at symbol um, to refer to another person, which, you know, I, I took my laptop one day and I went to Stacks in Hayes Valley, which is a, a, a brunch place, and took four hours over, over a waffle and some coffee. And um, anytime I saw an at symbol with a name, I would link them. And then we turned that into a, a reply slash mentions page. And suddenly conversation was born on the platform. We saw, you know, a few people using it, but that usage grew and grew and grew. We implemented it so everyone could use it and that made it more accessible. And then everyone started using it. Same thing happened with the hashtag. Chris Messina started putting this, uh, you know, hash um, slash, you know, uh, pound sign next to a word to tag um, by keyword and topic what his tweets were about. And um, we found a search engine called Samize. We acquired them because they were uh, recognizing all of these hashtags and uh, linking them to here's all the tweets that match that hashtag. And suddenly you had not com- not conversation between two people or multiple people, but you had conversation around a topic. And, uh, and that just opened another aperture. And then, you know, Tim O'Reilly, you know, started really pushing this concept of, okay, I'm following these people and all these people are following me. And I want the people following me to see what see this one tweet from who I'm following. So mm-hmm. I'm a rebroadcast it, which he called a, a retweet. And, uh, yeah, so and suddenly again, you started seeing the RT. Yeah. And then we implemented the RT away by making it mm-hmm. a button. And then everyone started doing it. And that created spread and network effects and contribution back to the conversation. So everything that has made Twitter Twitter has come from the people using it. It was not invented in-house. And some would argue that we didn't really invent Twitter. We only discovered it. And I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I think we tuned into something that was um, interesting, that was intriguing, that w- we didn't know what it was going to become. And in the same light, people figured out how to game it too. And, and that's right. Right, this you know, living, breathing organism, right, that, that you know, could also, you know, become a virus. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It could be it, at least at least the or path- have, yeah have a pathogen. A, a, yeah, at least at least the pathways and the vectors that it provides uh-huh. can carry um, both positive and, and and negative attributes. And um, you know, I was I was watching SpaceX Dragon launch yesterday uh-huh. last night, uh, and. I, I, you know, certainly taken aback by the accomplishment, but also taken aback that like we can be in this like big virtual conversation together. I don't know any of these people, but one of the screenshots I took was, you know, you know, the, the, the rocket, it was in the T minus 10. And, um, I was watching, uh, through Twitter and I just started seeing all these, uh, tweets and Periscope, uh, comments saying, you know, congrats or, you know, good luck from Mexico, good luck from India, good luck from, from Japan. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> I just couldn't, couldn't even imagine this in the past, like have one single plane where anyone around the world, um, can, uh, can, can just share how they're thinking and, and wish, wish well upon one another. But the flip of that is you, you know, like any tool, you can figure it out in a way such that you can use the vectors to be more destructive and to be distracting and to divide, um, which I, I think is antithetical to the base technology, but it doesn't mean that we should assume that it'll just work itself out. We, we have to actively um, maintain and, and, uh, and, and garden um, this, this conversation. And, um, you know, the, the challenge is, no one's done it at the scale before, so we have to learn it. Right. You know, we have to learn it in real time. And and part of the conversations like this is like, I want to I want to share that I'm I'm learning it in real time. We're learning it in real time, and we're going to make a ton of mistakes in the in along the way, but we're going to do it in public, and we're going to admit when we're wrong. And um, and we just haven't done enough of that in the past. On this idea of doing it in public, you know, failing and succeeding in the public eye, how do you? just as a human being um, deal with 
the reaction that comes with every single thing that you tweet? Like, do you, like, do you put a lot of thought into what you're putting out into the world? Do you not read your app mention? Like, how do you, like knowing that every, every time you tweet something, at least with respect to what's going on at Twitter, that you're gonna get, like, there's gonna be a certain percentage of people that are gonna wanna say not nice things. Like, how do you insulate yourself? How do you see that and take it to heart, but also protect your own, you know, emotional well-being? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is where the meditation practice has helped me a lot. Is just not constantly allowing myself to be reactive to whatever comes in front of me. This is the the less control I have over my own well being and space and 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 mindset, um, the less effective I am in fixing our issues. Mm-hmm. So, I, I approach it number one from that mindset of like, I wanna I wanna go into the arena and experience everything that people are thinking because I, the only way for me to really move forward is to at least see it, ideally to acknowledge it, figure out what I could learn from even the most negative, like what's the question behind the question, what's the statement behind the statement, What realizing also that, you know, people have a lot of, a lot of fear of companies like ours and, and, and me, you know, running companies like ours and they have a lot of distrust and expressing that comes out often as anger and it comes out as uh, hateful and it comes out as, um, you know, something that would otherwise set me off. But even that expression, even them um, doing that might disarm a little bit. Uh Um, I, I think, you know, with the rest of online, there's, there's very little consequence um, to doing something like that. Um, and uh, it's easy to be behind a keyboard and, and say things that you know, some people say, but um, I do think that there is a health aspect in um, enabling people to express themselves, but they certainly do not have a right for us to amplify that or to um, guide it to a person who wasn't open to accepting it. Um, and, and, and that's where the mechanics of the network fail today. Like it, it, you, there's just so many open doors that people can take advantage of, like replies, like trends, like search. Um, and you know, there's, there's some power in those doors being open, but if you don't feel you have, um, enough control over them or your own experience and you're just going to give up, why this isn't useful to me. Mm-hmm. And, and like, Ultimately, you know, as we think about health, we need to we need to realize two things. One, we need to we need to protect someone's physical safety to the best degree that we can, being an online platform. And then number two, we need to protect people's right to freely express themselves. And we do believe that's a fundamental global right. And we do believe that people um uh weaponize it and they and they game it and their intent is to silence one another and i I think everyone on the on the free speech absolutist side would agree that they prefer everyone to be able to speak and part of that agreement is making sure that people feel safe to do so in the first place Mm -hmm. so we have to guide all of our rules around those those concepts and principles in terms of you know, what is impacting someone's ability to freely express themselves. And, and, and then third, realize that, you know, the, the, the conversation to have is around attention and amplification and recommendation. That's where Twitter's true power is. And that's where I think we should be held a lot more accountable publicly is what we recommend, what we allow to be amplified, what we do with people's attention, um, which is you know, a, a scarce resource and, and something that our business is built off of. And what about capturing the, in, in speaking about capturing people's attention and maintaining it, how do you think about the addictive nature of not just your platform, but these social media platforms in general? Um, you know, we're, now in this era where we have people like Tristan Harris speaking out about um, 
the erosion of you know our analog lives as a result of our you know our being held hostage by our devices. On actually tomorrow, I'm uh, getting a guy on the podcast called Cal Newport. I wrote a book called Deep yeah. Work, and he's got a new book coming out called Digital Minimalism. Um, that's all about you know how how we can have healthier relationships with these devices while respecting the you know the addictive nature and what and, and what they truly are. And he talks a lot about, and Tristan talks a lot about how so much energy uh, is put into trying to maintain that attention on the platform. Like, is that like what's going on at Twitter with respect to how you've architected the platform for that purpose. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this goes back to the, the incentive um, conversation. Like we're, we're incentivizing uh, a lot more um, kind of social status than we are utility. And I, I think there's deep, deep utility within Twitter. You know, it's the, the fastest way and most influential way to get your thoughts to the world. There, there's nothing faster. I think it... Ultimately, also to find out what's going on and to figure out yeah, in yeah, real time. Yeah, and to, you know, it's the fastest way to tap into a global consciousness. Like there's nothing faster. It's not segmented by groups or communities or whatnot. It, everything's on the same plane. And there's a lot of power to that. But at the same time, you know, we need to make sure that we're aligning the incentives of the network towards that rather than... Um, you know, coming up with the best tweet that has the most likes because you're the most outraged or you have the best hot take without any sort of consideration around what's actually happening or, you know, like an event just unfolds, you quickly fire something off. Um, it's outrageous as hell, which really spreads it throughout the network. And, and then, you know, two hours later, you realize what you just said was a complete distortion of reality because something new breaks around the event. So, you know, I, I think we need to make sure, at least in the conversation with utility aspect, that we're, we're, we're incentivizing, you know, the breadth of the conversation, the, the, the timeline of the conversation, the, the fact that people can go back. It goes back to you know, what I hope to do with these podcasts. Like, you know, I, I started some with this year and like Bill Simmons and, and maybe... I was really terrible and maybe, you know, as people progress through the year with me, maybe maybe they see, you, you know, my conversational game, game gets get <laughs> gets point. much stronger and <laughs> and much more authentic and much more real and um and more open that that would be my hope. So the same thing I want to have happen on Twitter where you can see learning, you can see development, you can see iteration and and the beauty of conversation versus a post is conversation evolves, it iterates and it grows and it goes in directions and it's very fluid. So we need to show more of that. But in, in terms of the addictive natures of the technologies, yes, I, I think we're, we're making, at least from an OS level, we're, we're making the right first steps, which is giving people the data. So, you know, um, iOS and Android, both uh, in the base operating system now allow you to track how much time you spend on particular apps or how much you use your phone, and you can see it. I think it's a novelty right now. I don't, with the exception of potentially people's kids, um, I don't think people are actually utilizing that information um, in a way that is um, changing their behaviors. Um, at least that's my own experience. I, I look at my screen time and it hasn't made me make any other new decisions. So, you've shared it though. You've shared you've shared your screen time on Twitter before. Yeah, yeah. It, to to generate a, a conversation about it, but like it hasn't. There, there's no. Again, it goes back to incentives. There's no incentive for me to change right now. Like it, it, I just don't see the, like at least within that view, it's not presenting to me a a path as we talked about earlier with the water and and the wine. It, it, it's not presenting necessarily upfront a solution that points me in a direction that has more, you know, fulsome human connection. One of, one of the things we, at Twitter, our, our main uh, Twitter account at, at the company, we, we did this little thing yesterday where we tweeted, um, get off of Twitter, go tell someone that you love them, better to do it in person. And uh, one, I love that we 
do stuff like that because you know I, I, I don't want to be afraid of telling people to get off the thing, right. get off it. And like- Kara Swisher's rolling her eyes right now. <laughs> I know, and, and she will, <laughs> yeah. that, that's, that's, that's her prerogative. But like, I, I think, you know, if you look at the replies to that tweet, it's amazing. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, and if, you know, if we, if we can do whatever we can to encourage some fundamentally different human connection, great. But in every one of those moments we get to learn and it might have, you know, it might have seemed a little bit eye rolly or, or stupid or, or, or whatnot, but I don't want us to be afraid of stuff like that at that level um, because I, we get to learn from those opportunities and based on those learnings, we get to um, challenge our assumptions. But I, you know, I, the world we want to get to is, and I've said this on other podcasts, is I want I want people to walk away from Twitter, emphasis walk away from Twitter, feeling that they learned something. And right now I feel walk people walk away from Twitter feeling outraged or feeling overwhelmed or feeling um, like they don't know what the next um, step is or, or what the thing, why the thing's even valuable. So if we can direct a lot of our efforts towards like, you know, I put down the phone and I feel like I learned something and, you know, I want to, I want to build on it in this way and, and then share back the progress. Then we've, we've done the right thing. And I, I know that feels far away from what people perceive of Twitter today, but it's there and it does happen in small amounts. Like I, it, it's really a function of like what Twitter you follow. You, you follow um, health Twitter. You learn a mm-hmm. ton of stuff. You, you, uh, you know, um, Rhonda Patrick, Find My Fitness, you, Ben, um, Mercola, um, you know, just, you know, all along the spectrum of health from the very extreme to, you know, more the mainstream to, to the other end of it. Um, I learn so much from those conversations on the service. Yeah, I would agree with you. There's a lot of uh, pretty vile uh, arguments going on around diet, though. <laughs> you can fall yeah. into that rabbit hole as well. Yeah, yeah. And I would just say, you know, sort of, um, you know, respecting the challenges afoot and, and and the problems that you're facing. That on a personal level, um, you know, Twitter's been an unbelievable resource for me. I, I feel like I've built most of my career on the shoulders of Twitter because it's allowed me this unbelievable ability to directly connect with all these people that I respect and admire um, and have then been able to meet in real life for purposes of this show. But even, even before that, like it's been a tremendous value add in my personal experience. Um, and I would take that, you know, with everything else that it has. And, you know, now there's all these other social networks um, and I get a lot more traction on other ones, but Twitter is still like the first one that I go to in the morning when I have my social media time. It's like Twitter first, I wanna see what's going on right now. Yeah, and, and that, was a, that was a big shift when I came back to the company almost four years ago in, in that like, I, I think we were, we had a mindset too much of chasing after the people that we don't have, like trying to increase the pie, size of the pie as quickly as possible versus focusing on the people we do have. I, you know, I, we have some of the most influential people in the world using us. And while it might feel, I mean, it's, it's certainly smaller than others, it drives culture, it drives conversation. And we don't even know how to count the impressions that tweets get. We can't count tweets on CNN being screenshotted. We can't count the tweets being shown within newspapers. So the, the, you know, just the impressions that it has around the world is, is significant. And what we need to focus on is making sure that for the people who do love us, that we're giving them an opportunity to love us more and such that they want to, they want to talk about the value they're getting out of it. And back to your point, you know, it, it's a, it's a cost benefit analysis. Like, you know, there, there's certainly cost to Twitter. Um, and we're seeing, you know, more and more of that, like people being fired over tweets they tweeted 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and not being able to clarify what they meant. Um, and, you know, we also see a lot of benefit um, in ter- people like you who have said that they've built their networks, their careers, um, their understanding, their practice um, by engaging in these communities. We, um, you know, we have a woman who 
was in the Westboro Baptist Church who was using Twitter every single day to spread hate against the LGBTQA community. And um, there were, you know, four or five very patient folks on Twitter who were engaging her every day, every day, showing her a different perspective. And she left the church because of that. Mm -hmm. And she credits a lot of that to um, those conversations on Twitter and just showing her a, a different perspective. And you know, she's working on getting the rest of her family out of it. She was born into that church. So we don't do a great job at telling all those stories as well, um, but they're real and they're impactful and they're meaningful. And um, we, you know, we, we need to optimize for, for more of that occurrence, realizing that there's always going to be negative approaches. And our role is like, we, we can't amplify that. Like yeah. we, 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 we need to make sure that people have control over the experience. And if they choose to see everything, that's their right and their choice. But if they, you know, if, if they don't, you know, they, sh they should be able to have the conversation they want to have and, and be the host that they want to be. What do you foresee for the future as we kind of usher in this post-privacy, you know, culture and world that we live in um, where we're seemingly all gonna be held accountable for things that we said or did that were documented on Twitter and other platforms, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, as culture shifts, are we all just going to be, you know, put on trial for these things? Like we're in a very weird, awkward, um, in-between phase right now, trying to grapple with this issue. And we, you know, we're in cancel culture right mm -hmm. now, holding people, you know, hands to the fire for, for things that they did, you know, quite some time ago. Um, and I see that only becoming more problematic in the short run until we figure out as a culture, how we're going to manage this kind of thing. Uh, you've, you've talked about, you know, um, Carol's concept of uh, growth mindset on, yeah. on your podcast. Uh -huh. And if we, you know, if we have a culture that cancels people on mistake, there is no opportunity for growth mindset. There's no opportunity for learning. There's no opportunity for evolution. So I agree with you that we're in a weird state right now. I think as more people experience this and more people see that there is potential for learning, there's potential for rehabilitation, there's potential for redemption. I mean, we're, we're not just seeing this online. We're, you know, we're, we're seeing this in the prison systems in the United States. We're seeing this in like the conversation around um, infractions around like, you know, cannabis, cannabis sales in the past and what it now means that it's legalized within the state. And, mm -hmm. you know, the hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of people we put away because of that very thing. And, and just like the momentum of the framework and the system that doesn't allow for redemption or rehabilitation. So this is much broader than online and it's much broader than um, the conversation I think we're having. And I don't think we're allowing ourselves to connect all the dots. And I don't think we're, we're allowing our, our culture and our society to even have the chance at learning or growing. If, if, we, if we cancel everyone out, there, there's just no learning and eventually you're gonna trip up yourself. And if you're not giving someone else the benefit of the doubt, no one's gonna give you the benefit of the doubt either. And I, I, I think that experience will be had by a lot of people. Um, certainly all the younger folks and, and, and more and more um, of, an, of an older generation. Um, and as long as we have that open dialogue and, and show that it's okay, um, we're good. But you know, as Twitter, we could also do some things like we're, we're, you know, we're, we're thinking about this feature to allow people to go back and clarify tweets. Um, and what that might look like is uh, you might have said, you might have tweeted something five years ago about um, diet and someone might unearth it and say, you know, you know, Rich, you believe this. And before this, you believe, you believe this. And suddenly today that older tweet gets all this traction and mm -hmm. you can retweet it. And, uh, and then suddenly you might be known as the person that is completely inconsistent or in your views. Um, so you can imagine a feature where you could immediately go back clarify that tweet. And when you do so, it's kind of like a quote tweet, a quote, uh, a retweet with comment. And by doing so, by clarifying it, 
you're not allowing the original tweet to be retweeted without the clarification. Mm -hmm. So anytime someone retweets that original tweet, the clarification comes with it. So at least people have more context. Um, and, and things like that might make an impact. They may not at all, yeah. but we should test so it. It's also like a lot of work, right? Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna go back to 2008 and read all my tweets and whatever I said, you know, no, no, to no, try but to figure out what needs clarification. In reaction to someone like yeah. bringing something in the past up, right, you right. can immediately go to that tweet, clarify it, and then, uh -huh. and then the record is straight, right. at least in your experience. So walk me through a day in the life. What's it look like for you? Um, I know you two days a week you're here at the house, right? Yeah, I, I've been I've been working from home two days a week, which uh, I you know is a time for me to to read, to write, to consider, and just gives me a lot of the free time that I need um, to to think. Uh, the 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 other days are just back to back back meetings, and um, and and my life is in little little boxes in Google Calendar. But every day I, I wake up. Um, usually between 5.30 and uh, 6.30, and uh, I immediately start with a uh, cold shower. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is, my, that is my, caf my immediate caffeine in the morning, and it's kind of like this one of those small wins where I, I feel like I already won the day if I can go straight into cold water and have the mental capacity to do so then, and the... And the it just, it just feels I can take anything and just wakes me the hell up too. So I right go right away before coffee, before anything. Yep. I go straight into a cold shower and I'm there for like, you know, a minute to five minutes. And then I go into this room and I usually sit here and I, I meditate for an hour and I do a Vipassana based practice. And, um, and after that, um, I get ready. Uh, and I usually, um, turn you know turn to my phone at that point to see if there's any emergencies i i keep my phone either in my kitchen or my closet not next to my bed i you know i turn off all the notification notifications during the night and i don't really check it until about um you know 7 to 7:30 and when i'm walking into work um i leave the house around 7:30 um and my my office is about 5 miles away and takes me now about an hour, 15 minutes, an hour, 20 minutes to, to walk. And no matter, um, unless it's heavy rain, I, I do it, uh, you know, and anytime I'm going into the office, I, I walk. And sometimes it's really cold here. And, you know, the, the coldest mm -hmm. spin is uh, 39. Um, but it gets my blood going. It gets my mind going. And um, I listen to podcasts. I listen to uh, audiobooks. I Sometimes I just think. Sometimes I take phone calls. Um, I walk super fast. If you ever see me on the street, I look ridiculous because I'm just like you know, almost almost jogging. But um, it just same same route every day. Same uh, same route every day. Um, sometimes I, I deviate, but it, it adds time. So I, I I feel like I found the optimal path to uh -huh. to save to to save time. And I I kind of I've I've shifted my entire outfit to this walk. Like I wear all black because you. If I sweat, you can't see anything. <laughs> you can't see any stains. If it rains, like you can't see any of the, the wetness. And I, I wear these running sandals because they're the fastest. Um, that they enable me to move the fastest. They're what faster kind of, than what sneakers. What kind of running? Sandals? They're called Earth Runners. Um, Earthrunners dot com. They they're made up in Sonoma, I think. They may be in San Francisco now, but they're um, super simple. Like you know, if any of you are you have read Born to Run. Mm -hmm. uh, you know all the the running sandals, they're like fibrum, five finger type shoes. Well, they're they're pure they're pure sandals, so like they they don't have any of the art, uh, articulated toes or whatnot. So it's a you know it, it's like open. the Tarahumara sandals. Yes, the Tarahumara right. sandals. Um, and um, so I I usually wear those every day, which have been called out uh, as well in press. Like I'm wearing <laughs> I'm wearing these sandals and for, exposing my fashion. toes to go, the CEO of Goldman Sachs. Uh -huh. I'm like, man, should should I not? Expose my ugly hands either. Like what? <laughs> can't be, can't be human here. Um, so we, uh, so I, I walk in with those, and that iterated from sneakers, and I just try to find the, the fastest um, way to be in, and, and then like you know I, I wear, I wear these black jeans and this sweater that that keeps me warm, and you know I just wake up, put these on, and, and go, and then I breakfast. I don't eat breakfast. Um, I have one meal a day. 
intermittent um, fasting. Um, so I go, I, I have... Um, and that's every day? Every day, yeah. I, with the exception, I, I started experimenting a little bit recently um, where on... Well, let, I'll, I'll finish the rest of the day. So I, I, I go into Twitter first. Um, um, my first meeting is usually at 9. Um, I, I have meetings until about 2 p.m., and then I uh, walk across the street to Square. I, I usually stay until about um, six or seven. Um, I take a lift home. I don't walk back home. Um, I try to eat dinner at six thirty, around around six thirty or seven. Not not too late. Um, I go into the um, uh, infrared sauna, uh, which I, I really love. I, I do a workout. I do the seven minute workout uh, through an app. Um, sometimes I do multiple circuits of that. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then I eat and then I, um, I kind of wind down at nine thirty, try to be in bed at least by 10 and then go to sleep. I try to get nine hours of, of sleep. Uh, that's been hugely impactful, um, or a ring to, to keep me accountable to it. But, um, so I, I learned the one meal a day thing from, from Wim Hof, you know, two years ago. And I, I love learning through experimentation and I love experimenting on myself. And I've always been this way. I was, I was vegan for two years. It was, it's very hard to be vegan in St. Louis, Missouri, at least when I was, <laughs> I was, I was there. Yeah, but now you're in San Francisco. I know, Come on, I know, man. I know. I, I Maybe will reboot this. <laughs> I, I, so I love experimenting. I've always experimented with my diet. I've always experimented with, um, health practices. Some, I, some have been really informative to me and very healthy. Some have not. Um, but the, uh, the one meal a day thing, I, I, I just thought was a really interesting challenge. And I, I just, I heard it on a podcast. I think it was with him and Tim Harris. And I just like, mm, I want to try that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, after a week of some pain, I noticed I slept much deeper. And during the day I was so much more focused. So every day I, I fast for 22 hours. I, I have, you know, I have dinner within two hours and, I have a really, really big dinner, and um, and uh, recently, over the past few months, I've been uh, breaking that by by having um, as kind of a reward for making it through the week. On Friday morning, I go to Blue Bottle Coffee and I get one of their waffles, which mm-hmm. is amazing in the morning. And um, and then I that's won't, your big cheat. That's it. That's a cheat. And I won't. Um, what I've been doing recently is I won't eat until Saturday dinner. Um, so, uh, and the extended fast, cause I've been playing with even more extended, just pure water fast that the longest I've done is three days. And, uh, it is, it is trippy. Um, like the, the amount of focus I have on day three is like crazy. I, I was not expecting that. And I would eventually like to go beyond that just to see what, see what happens. But I, I have to package it into these weekends because I, I, I don't, trust myself enough to balance it with my, my day-to-day work and everything going on at the office and whatnot. So, um, yeah, when, when I learn something on a, a podcast like, like yours or, um, you know, something that like, you know, David Goggins is doing and, mm-hmm. uh, I, I try it, I try it for like a month and if I like it, I stick with it. And, uh, um, I, I, I just want to constantly experiment and that's, that's why I dropped out of school. That's why I, because I, I was learning so much more by experimenting myself, and I, I, I don't know any other way to learn, uh, by except by tinkering and playing and and trying new things and realizing early on that it was just a little bit too haphazard. Now I like really, if I'm gonna try something, I'm gonna dedicate months to it and like a common practice. And I have a lot of patience as a characteristic, and I have a lot of discipline. And I, I can really stick to something I, I say I'm going to do. So um, that, that is a practice. I also uh, been journaling since I was, I was very young, um, mostly, you know, through, through my phone. But before that, I was written journals and sometimes online. Um, that's where a lot of the ideas from Twitter came from was live journal. And just right. journaling in public, which was this like scary, scary idea to, to be like, what's the edge of honesty that you want to, be open about um, to other people that you don't know um, and who can follow you. Uh, and I, you know, I experiment with that every day at Twitter as well. And like some of that was me sharing my meditation in Myanmar. I was like, 
look, I'm a, I'm aware of what this might be perceived, independent of like what's happening within Myanmar, a, a tech guy in San Francisco, of course he does meditation. Of <laughs> course he's going to tweet about it. Of course, like uh-huh. he got bitten up by mosquitoes. This is going to show that off. Like it, it's so Silicon Valley episode. And like, uh-huh. I get that. That's the thing that kind of like I, I'm cognizant of. Like I'm just playing into this stereotype, but I don't care. I get value out of it. And I, I know I'm going to get some of that back and I know I'm going to get other things back. And I don't want to be afraid of at least creating potential for someone else who might be on the edge of trying something like this to like take the step or for it to resonate in such a way that they um, develop some questions in their mind. And because I would want that, I want, I get so much out of people being open and sharing. And even though that they might play into a stereotype, it, it helps me evolve and grow. So I, I need to model that behavior as well. And I, What's learning unless you share it? Well, I think, look, there's certain aspects of that that are, you know, stereotypically Silicon Valley esque. But I think what distinguishes it is the the self care aspect of it. To me, stands a little bit in in contradiction to this this uh, um, you know hustle porn culture that I think is also pervasive in Silicon yeah. Valley where you gotta work 25 hours a day and, and you know, sleep is for when you're dead and all of that. And for you to kind of say, look, I'm sleeping eight or nine hours a night. Yeah. Um, that and probably, I, I have the aura screenshots <laughs> yeah, to prove it. Just sharing you don't those me. or whatever. Um, um, living, you know, a relative, I mean, you show me around your house, like it's very, there's a, there's a minimalism aspect to it. Like you live, you know, for, for you know, compared to the way that you could live, um, you're living a relatively, you know, simple stripped down existence. Yeah, I mean, I... And how does that inform like your thinking and your equanimity and how you, you know, the, the creative, um, you know, impetus that you bring to business? I mean, the, the philosophy that I've always, that has always resonated most with me inherently and naturally and feels like I was, I was born with was, is, is this essentialism like what is absolutely essential in my life and even if you ask my parents you know when we moved into a new house and my you know my parents came from nothing they barely even graduated high school in St. Louis Missouri um, uh, didn't go to college were very upset when I didn't finish college because mm-hmm. I, would, I would be the one person in my family to yeah. do so but you know when we would move into a new house I always chose the smallest room and I always put the least amount of stuff in it and I, 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 I appreciate, um, I appreciate this concept of like, I want to figure out how to unlock everything I'm born with, because I know that's all I need. All I need is everything I'm born with. Like I, I don't need any of these objects. I don't need any of these technologies. I, I think, I think of Twitter as insanely useful but I think of most technologies as a crutch to point back to what we're inherently capable of. And in Twitter's case, you know, I, I think it represents the global consciousness. I think it's the closest thing we have to tapping into a, a global consciousness. And to be able to not just see what people are saying, but what they actually think, the sentiment behind it. And I inherently believe that we have that power internally. And I, I believe that Twitter's one of Twitter's role is to remind us of the potential. And, you know, if meditation can get me to a point where I can, where I can experience that and feel it, which, you know, what, which, which it has in some way, it's gotten me more in tune to my instinct and to my, into my gut and like my feelings. And I prove, I, I mark those moments of instinct and I, I mark them with enough weight, mental clarity and weight, whether it be through journaling or just considering it deeply that when the event does happen that I had an instinct about, I can tie it back. Right. And, oh, that's cool. And that's, and that has, that has shown me like this, these technologies, you know, like these rings that we're wearing, they're just reminders to me and crutches of what we inherently are, are, are born with and have the natural ability to do so. And, and they're mirrors. And if we can approach them 
in that light instead of something that drives us, which I think you know Tristan you know accurately articulates if we we will be able to develop a healthy relationship with them we're going to start any new technology we're going to start by a a, a a codependent relationship and then when when you get aware of the power and you get aware of the reflection the reflection is what becomes the interesting part and it's reflection back on you and mm-hmm. your consciousness and your awareness and anything that builds self-awareness any practice any, any tool any object is is something that I want to invest in, and and so I I keep my life fairly sparse because I think it'll be distracting otherwise. Do you canonize this in any specific like spiritual perspective that guides your life? Uh, I grew up Catholic, um, and uh, and my my parents are pretty devout Catholics, and my uncle's a priest. You know, every uh-huh. every uh, Christmas we go back, and he says mass. Um, but I was I was the one in my family that left St. Louis, and I was the one that was never confirmed by choice. And I I get my sense of spirituality through connection. And you know what Twitter represents is spiritual to me, like tapping into the consciousness, the you know the the the, the larger organism, um, whether it be. You know the, the the planet, the universe, the, the the social consciousness is what is what is what drives me, and it's the it's the answer I like to get at, you know, and the question that I like to ask, and um, so that's where I feel like the flow, and that's where I feel most alive is when I I feel like I can tap into that, and like you know um, I go down to Big Sur a lot, and Big Sur like we have this amazing fortune here in San Francisco, being able to travel two and a half hours away and go, um, uh, you know, to this place that you immediately feel is mystical because of the redwood trees on this dynamic coast that goes down a thousand feet to the ocean where you see whales and, and, and you just feel this, uh, this connection and this wisdom. And, um, I, I think that's so so powerful and such a, an important reminder. Like today is my day where I don't, you know, Saturdays is my day where I don't think about work at all with the exception of this conversation, mm-hmm. but it's at a different level. Um, I, I just clear the day completely to, you know, walk outside or to go down to Big Sur or um, to, to be with my best friends. I have dinner with them ideally once a week and just laugh and have, some wine together and they just had a baby. So that's a whole nother new, uh, sense of joy. And, um, I, I, I need a lot of that balance cause that, that is my, my spiritual connection at the moment. It's just like feeling that that connection in as tangible way as possible. And you, you know, you mentioned, you know, my, my path of like, you know, thinking about designing genes and botanical illustration. And I took a thousand hours of massage therapy along my path of, becoming an engineer and a CEO because I, I grew up writing programs and it's so damn abstract. You're so much in your head and you're not using your hands. And every time I realize I'm, I'm just like, my dreams were me programming my dreams. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was just a, such a weird experience where I, w- I would have this dream where I was programming the next part of my dream. And it was so lucid, but it was so, um, it wasn't grounded. So I would always shift towards something that I loved like botanical illustration and, and just drawing or something that would solve a need because I was developing carpal tunnel and I didn't uh-huh. just want to get a massage. I wanted to learn the the why behind it and the mechanics behind it so I could fix myself. And, um, but all these variations, these side paths, these forks in the road have always brought me back to building technology um, because um, and added depth and enriched building that technology because I, I, it's just where I feel my creativity most. Yeah. I know you had an interest in public transportation and like urban planning early days. I feel like you should get together with Elon and solve the traffic problem. Wait, <laughs> you I, guys together. I think he's trying to, to get the traffic to Mars. <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, he's going underground too. That's true. You know, that's true. Um, I can't help but think that there's this weird meta parallel between 
like your own personal uh, path towards broadening your consciousness and and you know raising your awareness and 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 growing as a as a human being and the kind of hive consciousness that is Twitter and the commitment to kind of raising the vibration of that, like the interplay between those, I think is super interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think um, in that sense, like, you know, back to our, our conversation around meditation, it, the, the observation is not just that we are um, external observers, but we are part of the system. The very act of observing is changing the system as well. And um, we, we have a responsibility to really reflect the essentialness of humanity and, um, and, and being that reflection on the world for all the good and all the bad. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of power to seeing, you know, how people think in ways that make us feel great and also things that are super uncomfortable because we, we need to be able to acknowledge those things. We mm-hmm. need to be able to acknowledge them first in order to have a conversation about it. And uh, there's no other path towards um, evolution and making something better unless we can talk about it. And, and, um, and uh, yeah, it, so it, it's all recursive. <laughs> it's right. all recursive. And the more I realize how recursive this world is, um, I think the better our answers get. But at the same time, it's easy to go down to a very, very abstract path. And I get that. And I, you know, we have to balance the practicality with it. But um, in that balance is, is, is something really magical. And sometimes we, we discover something really magical and sometimes we, we kind of get, get ourselves distracted. Yeah. You know, this, this um, uh, nonviolent communication, this, this, this concept, um, have, have you heard of it? Mm-hmm. Uh, it? It's just, you know, kind of a meditation on how we, how we communicate and utilizing words like uh, should uh, as, uh, as things that kind of restrict the growth mindset um, and immediately going towards solutions in our speech versus presenting more of needs and feelings. And, uh, I, you know, it, it, it's amazing how if you just change a few words in your dialogue, it changes the relationship with uh, the person you're having a conversation mm-hmm. with or it gets to something much deeper in the conversation. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a really good... Uh, the book is Nonviolent Communication. There's a, there's a good audio book read by the author um, uh, called Speaking Peace, um, which is sometimes corny at times because he picks up the guitar and sings, but it's uh, the substance and the framework and the system and the science behind it is real. And there's a so lot of gratitude. It's nonviolent in terms of the person that you're communicating with, but also with respect to the self. It's mainly right? yourself. Yeah. It's mainly yourself. Like saying the word, you know, we should. Uh-huh. It's inherently this, violent because it's holding you to a standard that you feel you can't meet or you can't you can't learn from. You you mm-hmm. can't um there's no path towards towards learning when you set this immediate expectation. Um but and that's just one example right. of the framework. So it's uh that that has been fairly enlightening. Just I, I love looking at how we lo- use language and you know, what one of the things that I I've been over years been trying to convince both my companies around is like we have this we have this word in technology called uh users uh and way back when when howard schultz was on the square board the ceo of starbucks he pulled me aside one day he's like why do you call your customers users i'm like oh, that's a good question i don't i don't know where it came from but we've always called them that mm-hmm. and then i started researching it and you know it was it was the the it was coined back in the early um, 80s when, or actually earlier than that, in the 70s, um, when people were using mainframes. And um, it was to represent an account, um, someone who was using the time on a mainframe. And then the people who were really good, like the engineers or the system administrators, kind of it developed this level system of, I'm a super admin and you're a user. Mm. And the user is stupid, and we can't trust what they do. So it became this term, losers, L-U-S-E-R-S. And then when models like Google came to be, they know, you know, they had no way to refer to their 
they, they didn't have a direct customer relationship with the exception of advertisers. But a lot of you know the value of something like Google and something like Twitter is uh, people coming to pay them with their attention, right. and that the, there's no you know monetary exchange as you would assume with customers, um, but there is a exchange of of value there, and it's in attention. So they called that a user of a system as well. So you, you use Google, mm-hmm. and you're, you're a user of Google. The problem with the word is that it creates this abstraction layer. So we have, you know, 330 million monthly active users on Twitter. And once you say that, it's this abstract thing. You, if you say we have 330 million uh, people, then you have more of this empathy uh-huh. for who you're serving and who you ideally want to serve. I, and I, I, look I, know, at, I look at it through this different lens as somebody who's in, in recovery. <laughs> recovery, Like a user is somebody who's an addict, right? Well, You're that's using. that's another thing yeah. is it's a very, it has, yeah. it has negative connotations to the word. Uh-huh. So, and, uh, and it breeds addiction right. as well. So like uh, we're, you know, in Square, we never use the word user. We use customer, we use seller, we use buyer as a word. Uh, we use individual, and it just it at least creates more potential for empathy. You know, I'm not going to mm-hmm. do it alone, but um, and I'm trying to get Twitter more and more there as well. Mm-hmm. So, where do you see Twitter five to ten years from now? Like, if you have your druthers and you're able to implement all of these changes that you would like to see, uh, you know, what does it what does it look like? Um, I think number one that we become known as you know we truly serve our purpose of serving not the public conversation but the global public conversation that the predominant conversations on our service are the existential conversations of the planet and you know in Yuval's recent book 21 lessons for the 21st century he talks about some of the existential conversations being climate change um, displacement of work through artificial intelligence uh, economic disparity um, these are conversations that no one nation state can solve alone. It requires all of humanity to work together to actually make an impact on, right? So I believe you need platforms like Twitter to host that conversation, to arrange the conversation, to enable the conversation to live and to iterate and to evolve. And I want to be a service that people at least have first consideration for learning from those existential mm-hmm. global conversations and also being able to participate in them. And we've seen evidence of that. Um, so that that's number one. Number two, in serving the public conversation, the global public conversation, we have a desire and it is a desire. It, you know, it, it, it's not, it's, it's a responsibility of all of us in the world, but It is a desire for us to promote health into that conversation. And I want us to be known by that. I want us to be known like if you engage in public conversation on Twitter, you should expect civil dialogue and debate and to learn something. And um, you, you you should, if you don't know how to get into a conversation in that way, we're going to teach you and we're going to teach you through the incentives as well. And, and that leads to the third point. I want to have a strong point of view within the network itself around uh, redemption and rehabilitation and teaching people how to converse. Like I'm trying to learn right now. Um, like we are ultimate as a company, we're ultimate students of conversation and like we're, we're distilling all of our learnings right into the product so that everyone can benefit from it. That sounds super idealistic. I get yeah. it. And again, back to back to the stereotypical Silicon Valley. But like, we have to have these aspirations. We're not going to get to ninety nine percent of it. We're going to get to eighty percent, maybe even less. But if we can get to that milestone, um, I think we'll improve the lives for you know a, a few people at least. And and maybe maybe that spreads and and maybe that pushes. But like I I, I think right now we're just we have such a binary view of the world of on platform off platform instead of like going back to what we were talking about earlier like how do we how do we put the growth mindset into twitter 
Like how do we enable people to come to it and learn from it? And um, that to me is, is the is a potential of technology. And I, I think we're going to be taught a lot by people growing up only knowing that I can have a conversation with anyone in the world at any point. I think that is fascinating. Like my, my friend's newborn who's only four months old, he's growing up in a world where he only knows touchscreens exist. He only knows um, that I, I could have a conversation with literally anyone in the, in the world instantly. He's growing up uh, to a world that has a, a you know, growing potential for a global currency like Bitcoin and native currency to the internet. That's not controlled by any central bank or nation state. Um, and, you know, therefore reflects a global citizenship in a very foundational way. Uh, that is powerful. And the more we can listen to that experience of like, you've only known this, what do you do with it? Like, what's the next step on this? And it's so exciting. Yeah, it's exciting. There is an idealism that 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 is, you know, venturing through everything that you just said, but it's it's beautifully articulated. And, you know, I, I hope that we see all of that come to fruition. You know, I worry about, you know, the base nature of, of us as human beings and this ticking clock that we're facing with global climate change. Like these are, you know, pressing matters that need redress in, in the short run. And let's, let's be eyes wide yeah. open about it. Let, let's see it truly. And um, it is, there are some scary things that all these technologies enable, yeah. but I don't know any other way to get over them, but sharing them eyes wide open and seeing them eyes wide open and like talking through them. Last question, self-serving question. Um, because uh, the genesis of, of Twitter came out of Odeo, which was initially intended to be podcasting. this podcasting platform, yeah. right? Come full circle. Um, <laughs> here we are in the midst of this golden age of podcasting, the mainstream adoption of this, of this form of media is you know penetrating to newer and deeper levels, which is really cool and exciting. And I, I really, you know, I believe in this medium um, at, you know, as a very potent um, means of really having meaningful conversations. And I love it to death. But if you were to start a new company today to disrupt this podcasting platform or perfect it or, you know, solve problems that you see as somebody who's a fan and a consumer of podcasts, do you have a sense of what that would look like? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I would first focus on um, starting with the problem of how do we provide economic incentive? That, that to me is like the biggest unlock. And I, I think right now we only have tools of um, attention and advertising. And I, I think some of the contribution models um, are, are just in their infancy. Um, and, you know, things like, like Patreon, Patreon or, right. and um, what Sam is doing in terms of his own explorations. Mm -hmm. And we're, we have some, you know, varying experiments in decentralization, but I would go after that problem first. I would... And I would pair it deeply with uh, the podcasting platform. I would, I would figure out the economic incentive first and foremost, and that they be on the same plane. Um, and I would look specifically to cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot, certainly in um, the ability to, you know, transact. But I think this concept of what an ICO, an initial coin offering, uh, at least points to. It doesn't offer today, but at least points to. Like someone could buy equity in your success, you know, buy equity right. in the more reach you have, they actually have economic incentive. And right. they then, because cool what's idea. interesting about that is it aligns incentives. Your listeners incentives are aligned with your incentives and mm -hmm. in that you want to have engaging rich conversations that people find valuable and valuable enough that they're sharing you or rating your podcast mm -hmm. or whatnot. And, an ICO at least points to um, a path towards aligning those incentives. And, and, and to me, like, that's the unlock is like, how do we get alignment of incentive between distribution of the podcast and the economic incentives that, that allow it to grow and to thrive or just to maintain? Some people don't want to grow their presence, but I want to spend 50% of my time on this. And in order to do that, I need to do 50% less of another thing that I make money for to you know, provide for my family. So that's what it all comes down to. So that's number one is that, you know, attack the problem of economic incentives and solve it in such a way that it is on the same surface as a distribution platform. 
And the second I would look at is how do we go, how do we um, look deeper into indexing what's in a podcast? Our search tools yeah. today are so weak, so weak. I mean, like I, we can't of, search voice exactly, and, but we can. But no we one can, is, uh, right? No one's built. No one's, doing no one's it, built it. Right. No one's built it. And the things I I think are exciting, like we've had so many keywords in this conversation, right? Like from. Uh, you know, from um, meditation to vipassana to aura, and if I could type or speak that word and find all the conversations about aura, or could just pull up the the thirty second clip of you talking about this, yeah. and it would live somewhere on the internet and be yeah, yeah catalog exactly, but also cross cross reference it with all the other conversations around uh-huh. aura, or um, to so to go deep in the media to allow that to be queried. And then once you have that, then you can do some cool things like, how do you expand your reach? You know, the, as you look at the world, the biggest way to expand your reach is translation. Mm-hmm. So automatically translating, no matter what language you speak, I can hear what I need to hear, no matter what language they speak. And, yeah. and there's a, technology can solve this today, but no one's put it together in one platform. So economic incentives smeared with distribution and then going deeper into the into the content and allowing more accessibility through translation or, or, or kind of the the trio of things I would look at to come together um, if I were to create one today. Odo 2.0. <laughs> we, maybe, <laughs> we, we, we gave up too early. We yeah. gave up too early. Well, yeah, it was a little, it was ahead of its time, but to be fair, it, it just wasn't where your interest lied at the time that, either. That is also you know? true. Yeah. Our interest lied with like, you know, one button push publishing, uh-huh. um, but we were all afraid to talk right. <laughs> in public. <laughs> it, like with our voices, we were, we were comfortable behind the keyboard at that time, but we, were, uh, we weren't podcasters. We weren't no. like you. We, we, we didn't enjoy the sound, not that you enjoy the sound early, of your own though. voice, but it was, it was also early. early. It, was it was early. Too early. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. This uh, awesome. It was great. We didn't even talk about Square or Bitcoin really or crypto or anything like that. So maybe There's I can a lot there. talk you into uh, doing this, doing another yeah. round to focus on that. We'll, we'll come back after a significant launch yeah, there. Yeah, cool. How's that? Um, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, super fascinating. Um, I said that that was the last question, but I have one more. I've now had, I had Biz on the podcast. Now I've had you. I've been doing this podcast for six years. <laughs> I've written three books. Am I going to get that blue check ever? <laughs> I'm still not verified. I don't know what I got to do. Yeah, it, it's we're in such a weird state with our <laughs> verification program. Um, not that I don't care, but I just think it's funny. Yeah, no, no, no. Let let let's see what we can do. But um, we we need to move that whole program away from like this blue badge and more towards credibility around the topic. Yeah. Well, it, the the idea originally was that it was legitimizing that somebody you know, actually was who they say they are. And that applies to journalists and professional athletes so that people aren't, aren't out there mimicking them. Um, but then it, became, it got co-opted into this status thing. Yeah, and it's, it, it's also just too coarse grain. It's at the account uh-huh. level. And so what we want to do ultimately is like, you know, how do we establish credibility within a topic space? And um, authority, domain expertise within the topic space. I'm pretty credible in my topic space. I know you are. I know you are. <laughs> and like right now, we just yeah. don't have the framework to yeah, do that. Right. So we'll uh, no blue and, check for now. And unfortunately, it has created this like you know, this two class distinction that yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. really upset by, and I think it's unfortunate. But the, and here it is. All right, man. Till next time. Till next Thanks, time. Jack. Thank Peace, you, brother. Bye. All right. So that happened. I thought it was pretty cool. What do you guys think? It's not often that you get to sit down with somebody who has literally changed the world. So I just want to, again, thank Jack for taking the time to share his life with me and uh, with all of you guys. And I just got to say that that experience, this experience of spending basically the better part of an afternoon with Jack, it, it, it really did change me. I left his house that day thinking much more deeply about the level of intentionality that I bring to my day. You know, I'm a busy guy, like a lot of people. I'm prone to stress and anxiety and distraction. And I found the fact that somebody with such an insane level of responsibility has 
so effectively and mindfully stripped away the non-essential distraction to prioritize deep thinking and self-care and to really feed his hunger to be constantly learning uh, and involving. And I think that's impressive. Uh, it stayed with me. And I hope it left you considering the level of intentionality that, uh, that you bring to your daily existence. Uh, do me a favor, let Jack know what you thought of this conversation. He is at Jack on Twitter. That's the place to find him. Uh, and please check out the links, the show notes, et cetera, on the episode page, all the show notes that we put together that we compile uh, at richroll.com. If you're looking to dial up your nutrition and need some expert guidance, we've got a special limited time offer on our amazing Plant Power Meal Planner, $20 off an annual membership when you sign up at meals.richroll.com and use the code POWER20 at checkout. Uh, there you will get thousands of customized plant-based recipes, unlimited grocery lists, grocery delivery in lots of metropolitan areas, uh, and access to professional nutrition coaches seven days a week. And you get all of that for basically $1.50 a week, a cup of coffee. It's an amazing product. We're super proud of it. So check it out, meals.richroll.com, code POWER20 at checkout for $20 off. Uh, that offer expires on April 13th, so get on it. If you'd like to support our work here on the podcast, uh, just tell your friends about the program. Share your favorite episode uh, in person or on social media. Uh, tag me, take a screen grab, share it on your favorite platform. Uh, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, all those good places. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts and you can support us financially at Patreon at richroll.com forward slash donate. I want to thank everybody who helped put on the show today. Jason Camiolo, audio engineering, production, show notes, interstitial music, tons of behind the scenes stuff. Uh, Blake Curtis and Margot Lubin, who normally video uh, the show, but this one was not on video. Jessica Miranda for graphics, DK David Kahn for advertiser relationships and theme music, as always, by Anna Lemma. Thank you for the love, people. See you back here in a couple days with a, uh, a really fun one, super fun conversation with musician Mike Posner. Uh, this guy is an absolute gem. I think you guys are going to really dig it. So until then, be kind. Peace. Plants. Positive tweets. Namaste. Yeah.